up and speak his word. Rise up to what you Christ. Rise up this very hour. Rise up with Jesus Christ. Rise up in Jesus' name. Open eyes and heal the lame. Rise up, declare his truth. We're the ones who cannot lose. And rise. We've got to rise. Because I want to talk to you about what we would call a life of obedient gratitude. A life of obedient gratitude. Now, basically, uh, the other side of this would be called the discipline of grace. And when you say discipline, most people don't think discipline would match with grace. Uh, but it does. As a matter of fact, grace gives you the ability to have discipline. Right? Think about that. Have you ever noticed, we always use that term, was it Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You ever notice we, we say that when we're going through something so that we can withstand it and overcome it or get through it. You ever notice that? But we don't use that a lot of times in areas of discipline. You know, well, I can do this. Why? Uh, because Christ strengthens me. He gives me strength to discipline myself. Well, that's what grace does. Grace is not, as I heard one person say, a get out of hell free card that you can still live any way you've ever lived and still be a sinner, quote unquote sinner, and think you're in grace. Because grace, according to Titus, and we're going to look at the scripture, actually says that grace gives us the power to live above sin. He empowers us not to sin. Now, that doesn't mean, now, and you have to look at what the word sin means because the word for sin in the Greek, there's a couple of different words actually. But the main one <clears throat> that we deal with, it means, as you probably heard, to miss the mark. So anytime you miss the mark, you have sinned in that degree. <clears throat> However, um, a lot of people don't realize this, but there are degrees of sin. Everybody says, well, no, there's no degrees of sin, of sin, of sin. No, that's not true. Uh, there are sins that are we would be we would classify them. The Bible classifies them as death penalty sins, and you know it's just like it's amazing how humans have done a lot of things because they saw it in God, and we imitate things we see in God, and we have misdemeanors and we have felonies, and then there are degrees in each, and it's the same thing with sin. Uh, meaning, uh, there are people who sin but are not sinners in the sense that they miss the mark, but that's different than living a life of sin. Does that make sense? So <clears throat> I'm not going to get into a whole lot of that today, but I do want to give you some scriptures to go through. Now, here's what I want you to think about. Every, every example that Paul used for the Christian life was either one of three things. It, it involved one of three things. It involved the military, it involved sports, or it involved marriage. How many of you know that it, those three things, the one thing that runs true in all of those is discipline? Because, in the, and Paul even talks about it, we're going to look at the scriptures, <clears throat> but the one thing Paul never did, he never used a lackadaisical, lazy life as an example of the Christian life. Not one time. He never used any type of example of, well, it's all okay. It'll all work out the end. It's all this. No, there's, you know, there's truth. It'll all work out in the end. It may not work out the way you want it to in the end, but it's going to work out the way God wanted it to in the end. But have you know we're not in the end yet, right? And that's why we have to pray because everything doesn't work out the way God wants it to unless we pray because that's what he said to pray about was that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if we have to pray for that, that means that it's not automatically being done. Amen? <clears throat> so every time he used these uh, examples, these illustrations, every one of these require discipline. <clears throat> Even the term disciple 
is a part of the word discipline. It means a disciplined one, right? Negative examples, now, now get this. Any negative example that Paul used, it never included discipline, but always rather emphasized the lack of discipline or the lack of obedience. Now, I'm giving you things to think about as you read through Scripture and you read what he said, and I'm not going to go through every one of all these different things, but I will give you uh, some basic well, some scriptures to look at. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, it says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Now, if you look at this, this is also where he talked about certain things going on. He says, if somebody gets a word, do this, wait, and let this person. He says, let all things be done decently and in order, right? And so there is an order. God is a God of order. He likes order. That's why we have the solar system. See, when you have systems, there's order in systems, right? God did not create chaos. God creates order, and he brings order out of chaos. Amen? Now, so uh, even in the place <clears throat> in the scripture where it says uh, just before this in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, you know, don't let women speak in church and all that kind of stuff, and people have really taken that out of context and, you know, tried to stop women from preaching or ministering or teaching or anything. And all he's talking about is whatever happens, let it be done decently and in order. Because back in the day, uh, women and men sat on opposite sides of the church, uh, of the building that they were in, the house or wherever they were at. And there's many places I've been that that's still the case. And now this has never happened where I was at, but in Paul's day, there were times whenever somebody would say something from the pulpit. And a wife, because she was on the other side of the room, would speak out to her husband and say, is that right? And is that, what's he talking about? And they said, no, let him be quiet. Let him learn at home. In other words, wait till you get home and then you discuss it. So he wasn't saying women, women are not to speak in the church. Women should never open their mouth in the church. That, that's not Bible, right? <clears throat> in Christ, there's neither male nor female. Amen? Amen? The first preacher of the resurrection was a woman, right? right. Think about that, right? And, and I mean... There's just all through Scripture. When you look at in Hebrews chapter 11, many women are also mentioned there. Women receive their dead, raised to life. Doesn't say that about men. <coughs> Not putting men down, just saying it doesn't say that about them, right? <clears throat> so, now, uh, so I just want you to realize. But now, here he says, for God is not the author of confusion. And that word confusion means disorder or instability. Isn't that something? God is not the author of confusion, he's not the author of disorder, and he's not the author of instability. You ever see people <clears throat> that, I mean, man, they, get, they know all the scriptures, they know all the stuff to say, they know exactly the buzzwords, you know, the, the, the common uh, statements that everybody says, you know, well, how you doing, oh, blessed and highly favored, you know, they got it down. And, and, then you, and then somebody standing next to him and say, well, just outside in the hallway, you said you were going through this and this and then, but now you say blessed and highly favored. What? And it's because we're trained to react a certain way and put on mask. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and to make, it sure everything, make sure everybody thinks that everything's okay. And God said that he is not the author of confusion or disorder. And like I'm saying, these, there's a lot of people who are uh, unstable. And the Bible talks about people who are unstable and not in a good way. And he tells them to be, to gain stability. And I can speak on this because this was me. My life was up and down, up and down. And I could go into detail, you know, and I mean, one day, praise the Lord, you know, all this, the next day, just, I mean, you know, off the chart, uh, either depressed or you know, to go off into sin just because I got mad or something, just crazy stuff. It, that's instability. <clears throat> now, church instability, Christians in church, the instability sometimes isn't about sin. Sometimes it's just you're instable or unstable. <clears throat> you have no, no stability in the area of just commitment even to a local body or to one another to know because if you just flit around, now listen, this is not a, you know, I'm not trying to hit on anything. I don't know who shows up, who doesn't show up. I don't keep records of that kind of stuff. I don't, I, I'm not, just please hear what I'm saying. 
and don't think that I have an ulterior motive. There's no ulterior motive except giving you the word of God. That is it, I can tell you. I don't know any of your situations, so I'm not trying to point anybody out and that kind of stuff. This is truth, and I just want you to get it so that if it does apply to you, you can fix it. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and myself, I was in a lot of ways the same way uh, early on because I was trying to find a good church. And so I would go to this church for a bit and then go to another church for a bit and sometimes go to one church in the morning and another church at night when they had night services and different things like this. And so, <clears throat> but the thing was, I was looking for the word of God. I wasn't looking for what I wanted to hear, you know, something that would tell me I was okay and everything was perfect. I was looking for the word of God. I wanted to hear truth. And so I would, you know, sometimes bounce around. And, <clears throat> but the beauty of, some of what happened then is I was able to meet people and we ended up hanging out at Jack in the Box after church and talking for three hours and just sitting there. And while the kids were playing, see, we'd sit in the back, have the kids all crowded in one area, and then we would sit a little ways up and that way the kids couldn't get past us to get into the rest of the restaurant and we'd keep them back there. And then we would, that was the church annex. <laughs> and so we would go there. <clears throat> and so we'd go there and talk till midnight many times. And it was just a great time of fellowship. And honestly, that was more church than the church I went to because everybody had a psalm, had a hymn, had a teaching, had a discussion. Everybody had some input, which is what you want to happen. And that's one of the reasons why we have life teams. Well, a lot of people, though, when you start hitting on things, all of a sudden they get uncomfortable and they want to go to another place at least until you quit that series of teachings. And then they come back in. And then we, we've seen that too. And that's, you know, well, that's not fine. It's up to you. But still, at some point, sometimes God says specific things to help specific people. You know, and, and I mean, I've been in places where I thought, man, that didn't, that message did nothing for me. And then, you know, and I'm like, well, maybe I ought to go somewhere else. And then God said, you know what? Every message isn't for you. Sometimes you ought to sit there and listen to it because it doesn't hurt to hear it again. Sometimes it's for somebody else and you need to let them get it because sometimes God needs to get a hold of them. I'm like, okay. And then other times it's like, right there, this is for you, you know. <clears throat> and, and it's funny because those are the ones you don't think are for you. I mean, it's like, man, we're so-and-so. They need to be here. They need to hear this one. You know, it's like, no, whoever needs to hear it, they hear it. You're there. So, okay. anyway, so. God is not the author of confusion, of disorder, of instability. He wants you to be stable. He wants you to be solid. He wants you to have stability. Now, sin is disorder. It is chaotic. It is not orderly. It is, it is confusion. Amen? And so when you live a life of commitment and discipline toward God, it's amazing how sin falls away. Because, and it's not just, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sinning because I'm doing this. Well, that's probably true, because if you're doing one thing, you can't do two things at the same time usually. And so it's good to replace certain things. But at the same time, it's not, you're not, not sinning just because you're doing that. Maybe you're doing that because you don't want to sin. That's a good thing. Does that, does that make sense? And so you can replace certain things. But that doesn't change your heart. Now, you can do things, and like we've said before, you can act yourself into believing faster than you can believe yourself into acting. Amen. And so many times, that is the area of discipline. You start disciplining yourself. I was talking <clears throat> with, with George this week, as a matter of fact, and we had hit on some of these topics. And sometimes people say, well, um, you know, am, am I doing that? You know, is, is that the Lord or is it me? You know, is, is this the Lord leading me to do this or is this just me wanting to do this and I'm talking about a good thing, you know. You see a person, homeless person, and you think, man, you know, I ought to go buy them a blanket. And then you're like, okay, is that the Lord or is that me? Who cares? There's a person cold. Buy a blanket, right? You, well, if you find out you get to heaven and, they, and God says, that wasn't me, I'm sure he's not going to be upset, right? Even though it was him in you that made you want to do it to begin with. Amen. But people are really hung up on this. Well, you know, I just want to follow the Lord. Uh, well, if you want to follow the Lord, first you got to get in his path. And when you get in his path, you do the things he likes. And when you're doing the things he likes, then it's easier for him to turn you to do the specific things. But see, there's things you shouldn't have to be told. The Lord shouldn't have to tell you to feed the hungry. That's right. He's already told you that. He shouldn't have to give you a word, you know, from the pulpit or 
a prophetic word, you know, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, you know, buy somebody a meal, do something to share the, the gospel. He shouldn't even have to tell you, he ought to have to tell you the bigger things or more uh, personal things about your life to fix that. He shouldn't even have to tell you that stuff. That should just be life. That should just be, honestly, that just should just be being a human, especially a saved human. Amen? You're awful quiet. <laughs> okay, okay. <clears throat> In Titus chapter 2. Verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. In other words, all people have access to it. Teaching us that, so this is what the grace of God teaches us. That denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You hear that? When people say, well, but, oh, you know, but it's grace, so I don't have to worry about it. No, grace didn't give you the right to live the way sinners live. Grace gives you the ability to live beyond that, overcome that, and he strengthens you so that you can do all things, which means that you can resist temptation. Right. Isn't that amazing? We, we believe he can strengthen us to do all things except resist temptation. <laughs> no, he needs, we need to realize when you look at the word of God, God is always interested in holiness. He's always interested in righteousness. Why? Because that's the path of life. And if you're not living in that path, you're living in the path of death. And that's where a lot of problems come in. It's because you're not walking in the path that he told you to walk in. Now, it says, <clears throat> verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. Well, let's back up. Verse 13 looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. You hear that? So that tells us that we should be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. Does that make sense? See, the, here's the problem. The, people call it the book of Revelation. It's not the book of Revelation. It's the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right. The Bible, the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ is about the revealing of Jesus, not to tell you who the Antichrist is. <laughs> It is not the book of the revelation of the Antichrist. Right. It's the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Man. Do you get that? Now, and yet, in times, everybody wants to talk about the Antichrist. Now, I, I get it. It's a topic. It's a thing. And you can see certain things going on. But at the same time, uh, whatever we need to know, he will tell us. Right. Yeah. Whatever we need to know in the Bible that we need in the Bible, it's there. If it's not there, there's a reason it's not there. Right. Right? The reason it doesn't tell you the day of your death is because half the people, if they read it, go, oh, that's the day I'm going to die right there. There's, there's the date. Then some of them would live riotlessly, or riot, riotly. <laughs> get the, not righteously, riotously, okay? Get through different. Up until 10 minutes before, and then try to get it all under the blood, right? And so it's good sometimes not to know everything. Amen? Amen. So, <clears throat> so we have to look at the next part who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You hear that? Salvation makes you zealous of good works. It does not, grace does not cause you to not to want to do good works. But yet in many of the, what I would call the hyper grace uh, movement or camp, uh, if you mention good works, they cut off the good and say it's works and you can't do it. That's wrong. We should be zealous of good works. Amen. Amen? Why? Because the works that Jesus did, we should do also in greater works than these will we do. Why? Because he went to the Father. Is that right? Amen. So, now notice, it also says a peculiar people. That does not mean what you think it means. <laughs> Even though many of you live that out. <laughs> okay, anyway. <laughs> People say, well, he's a peculiar sort. That, no, that's not what that means. The word peculiar here in the Greek means surrounded. It, it, is, it could actually be an idea of sanctification, meaning being separated, right? So it's talking about a peculiar people, a separated people, people who are surrounded by the grace of God that are zealous to good works. That's what that means. It doesn't mean be weird. Do, do you get that? He's not looking for a weird people, right? That's how we come to him and hopefully... He fixes us so we're not weird. But then you come to church and they teach you to be weird. Weird is not of God. Do you get that? Weird is not of God. Jesus was not weird. 
Children love Jesus. They came to Jesus. Children don't run up to weird people. They're, they're good judges of character. They stay away from weird people. Listen, if you'd watch who children avoid and avoid them, you'd be better off. Just say it. Matter of fact, they say that if you just do what a child does all day long, uh, you'll be in perfect shape. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. That's, if you just watch them, they have boundless energy. Isn't that right? <clears throat> so if you just chase after them all day long, I guess that'll do it too. So anyway. So Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Yeah, actually, let me go back to the last part of Titus 2, verse 15. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. You hear that? The things that were just said, speak, exhort, rebuke with all authority, and don't let anybody despise you. That means that we're supposed to be saying everything that this said here in Titus 2, that what grace does, right? So don't let people that try to move into lawlessness and call it grace. Don't let them shout you down, or in today's language, don't let them cancel you. Amen? You have to have a voice louder than theirs. And your louder voice is good works. Because they can't deny that. Right? So, now, Romans chapter 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Now that verse, a lot of people need to read that verse, these two verses every day. And remember that, okay? Then in verse 16, he says, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey. Now, it get, that didn't get much simpler than that. Who you serve, you're the servant of. He even goes on and says, Whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. Now notice, he did not make a difference. He's talking to Christians. But he didn't say, now I'm not talking to you, I'm talking about those sinners out there. He didn't say that. He said, you've got to know, you, you Christians in Rome, don't be like Rome. Don't do what they do. He's saying, you have to understand that whoever you serve that's your master, and that's who you're the servant of. And then he breaks it down and says, so if you serve sin, your master is sin, and you serve sin unto death. But if your master is God, if your master is righteousness, then you're going to live righteous unto life. Man. Now, th see, that's the thing. <clears throat> we have this idea in church that you say a prayer, uh, sign a card, shake a hand, something, whatever it is, and everything's good. You cannot find any of those things in the Bible. What you find in the Bible is Jesus said, come, follow me, take up my cross, lay down your life, and follow in the path after me. And in the Greek, the tense of those words is be following me. In other words, once you start, keep going. Don't stop. It wasn't a one-time deal. Whenever you came out of your mother's womb, and that doctor, you know, in the old days, hold you by the legs and pat your behind until you yelled, uh, you took a deep breath, which is supposedly why they did that, to get you to take a deep breath. And guess what? You didn't take one deep breath and stop breathing after that because you're still here. Isn't that right? So when you got born the first time, you had to breathe and keep on breathing. What makes you think when you get born the second time that now you don't have to do the same thing that you did the first time that once you take in the breath of life, you have to live in the breath of life? It's just sila. Think about it. Amen? <laughs> you didn't do something one time. You start on a path, and it's a journey that you follow, and hopefully you get better on the path. That you get better. You ever see children run down a path, and they're not watching? They're just looking where they're going, which is good to you know, look at the end thing, but they're not watching their steps, and they trip, and they fall, and they do all kinds of scrape themselves up and all kinds of stuff. But as you get older... You're able to look at your goal, look at your destination, and notice along the way so you don't trip and fall. That's growing up in Christ. Amen? All right, so he says here, <clears throat> whether of sin unto death or of, now what you saying? Of obedience unto righteousness. Wow, look at that. So righteousness has obedience connected to it. If you're not obedient, you're not walking in righteousness. Do you understand that? Now, I know this is going to be 
probably different from what you generally hear if you listen to Christian television or this other stuff. But all I'm doing is reading the Bible. Amen? Amen. I'm not quoting so-and-so or Dr. Such-and-Such who said this and did away with the Bible. I'm, I'm reading what Jesus said. I'm reading what his apostle Paul said. I'm reading the word of God. Amen? Amen? He says, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. What does that mean? You are not serving sin anymore, right? <clears throat> Unless you're serving sin. If you're serving sin, guess what? You're still a servant of sin. So just call, listen, calling yourself a brain surgeon doesn't mean you're a brain surgeon. You can call yourself anything. What you are is what you do. It's how you live. Amen? Amen. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Amen. Now notice what you had to do. You had to obey that, the doctrine that had been delivered, which said, sin not. What he had just said up here, should we still sin just because we're under grace? God forbid. Do you hear that? Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, so what are we talking about? We're talking about the discipline of grace. We're talking about the life of obedient gratitude, which we're going to get to that in just a minute of why and how you can live in obedient gratitude, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Oh, look at there. You can receive the grace of God in vain. What does that mean? That means that you don't walk in it, that you don't walk in the ability to live above sin and live in righteousness, because that's what grace does. We have to see, we got this idea for so many years. I heard that preach, you know, grace, uh, and there is a truth to the fact that grace gives you time to get right. There, there, is, that is, there is a truth to that. But we have to realize that for most people uh, that want to make that time the rest of their life, that ain't it. That time is based on what you know. Boy, it's quiet in here. <laughs> okay, well, we'll keep going. All right, we'll see. Okay. Now, he says in verse 2, For he saith, I have heard thee, and a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. How? In much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults. A tu now, the word tumult is actually also one of the meanings of the word confusion that I read just a minute ago. God is not the author of confusion. That word also, uh, the word tumult, is one of the definitions, which literally means a chaotic mob in a chaotic lifestyle right? Just wildness, you might say, okay? They prove themselves in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, no fake love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. In other words, they were called this. They were called deceivers, but yet they were true. As unknown and yet well-known. As dying and behold, we live. As chastened and not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing and yet possessing all things. Paul said, this is how we approve ourselves. This is how we prove who we are, right? <clears throat> like Othniel was saying today that many times people find their, their you know, well, in, in their life, they look at situations and they look at their circumstances and they look at whether they're being blessed or whether they're going through a hard time. And when they're being blessed, oh, God is good. When there's hard times, well, I can't depend on God. I'm going to leave God. I don't, I don't care. That must not be true. No, that's, in state, that's unstable. Amen? You have to be stable going through many things because things, good, bad things happen to good people, right. right? Now, a lot of stuff you can eliminate, but there's some things, persecutions, things like that, you can't always eliminate because right. Jesus said there will be tribulation. He said you will be persecuted, right? right? And just the fact that here in America, we have not had much persecution, 
uh, that doesn't mean we won't have it. It just means we ought to be thankful that we haven't had it so far. Amen. But that also, see, the, but the enemy also knows that if he can get you to be complacent and be weak, then when the time comes, you won't have the discipline and strength to stand and stand for what you believe. Amen? Amen. So, here he says, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, Paul talking to Timothy, and now talking to us, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. But remember, it was Paul that wrote to Titus and said, Grace teaches us how to live righteously. So when Paul says, be strong in grace, he did not mean, oh yeah, don't worry about sinning, don't worry about messing up, don't worry about that stuff. He was saying, be strong in grace. Understand that God's grace is with you. That's why Paul said, three times I besought the Lord that he would remove this thing from me and he'd take it from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient. Do you get that? In other words, everything's not going to be removed, but grace gives you the power to live through it and live above it. That's what grace does. Grace is not weak. It is not some sissified type of theology, right? Grace takes a strength. Jesus was full of grace, amen? And he had a strength in him not to bow to what the enemy tried to bring to him. Instead, he knew his purpose, he knew his destiny, and he was determined to fulfill it and walk in every step that had been foreordained by, by God for him. <clears throat> so, he says... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So he's saying, now you need to share this, everything you've heard. Then in verse 3, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Notice again, an example of a soldier. Now watch what he says about this. Verse 4, no man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Why? So that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. So now what he's saying is you can choose to not be entangled in the affairs of life. That is your choice. And if you're going to, and listen, if you're going to not be entangled, you're going to endure hardness. Number one, it's hard not getting entangled. That's the first thing, right? But then beyond that, you're going to realize that once you've made a stand, See, listen, entangled doesn't mean, uh, you know, well, I have to sit down and pay the bills and go through all the deal and make sure balance the checkbook. That's not entangled, right? That is daily life that you have to do. When he's talking about being entangled, he's saying, don't become like the world. Don't do everything they're doing. Don't get entangled with them. Well, but, but they're, they're saying, I don't care about people if I don't wear a mask. <laughs> well, do you care about people? Yes. Then why do you let what they say bother you? Right. Where's your... You know, where, where do you get your validation from? Do you get it from people and their opinion, or do you get it from God? Because let me tell you, if everybody's going to line up, and at the end of your life, if you think everybody's going to stand up and go, oh, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. No, they're not going to do that. Only one that's going to do that would be Jesus, if you've been that. But let me tell you, he ain't going to say that about you if you ain't done it, because he ain't going to lie for you. We just need to repeat that. Okay. <laughs> Jesus is not going to lie for you and say, well done, if you didn't well do. Right. Amen? You got that? Amen. He's not going to lie for you. So, but everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's going to be my end. How do you know that's going to be your end? Are you well doing? Because the Bible says that we're not to grow weary in well doing. Isn't that right? So we need to realize that everybody's not going to agree with you. They didn't agree with Jesus. Right? Even Now, there were times that he had great acclamation. Everybody, oh, this is a great man, a great prophet, great teacher, and they were all behind him. But even then, he had the Pharisees over there trying to figure out how to kill him. And after he raised Lazarus from the dead, then they tried to figure out how to kill Lazarus too because he was a witness, right? <laughs> and so now they're all trying to kill him. And then the very people that were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, one week later, now they're saying, crucify him, crucify him. So like Dr. Summerall used to tell us, other people's heads is a terrible place to put your happiness. I got a t-shirt I saw right back there in my office. I thought about bringing it out, but maybe I should have. It just said, of course, your opinion matters, just not to me. So anyway, <laughs> why? Because now and that doesn't mean be rude. It doesn't mean treat people a certain way. It means you should not hang your validity or your validation or your value on what people say about you because they will change. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You know, I mean, minute by minute, they will change about you. Oh, yeah. You know, the first time you don't, do something they want, all of a sudden, you know, used to, you were great, and next thing, oh, you're terrible. Oh, 
Well, just because you didn't do what they wanted. Right? So you just need to make sure you're doing what he wants. That's what counts. <clears throat> now, because there'll be more for us than those that are against us. So <clears throat> he says in verse 5, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. You hear that? Paul is using this in the example of being a witness for Jesus Christ. He's saying, if you're going to, if you're going to run the race, as, as he would say here, then he said, you've got to run legally. You've got to play by the rules. Well, let me tell you, the rules are not written in Washington. The rules were written before the foundation of this world. Amen. Amen? Amen. And if you're going to run this race and be successful, you're going to go by these rules and no other rules. Because if you don't run by these rules, you can get disqualified. Now, see, people don't even believe that. But I will read it to you here in a second. <laughs> so, he says, If a man also strive for masteries or for, to win, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. So, what that is saying is that if, listen, you may look like you win, but if you cheated to get there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you won't get crowned. Okay, we'll just keep on going. <laughs> Verse 6, the husband, I didn't read that while ago whenever I was putting this together. Because, see, what I do is I, I get ready all week, and I let God <laughs> build the stuff into me, right? And then usually, to make sure it's what he wants me to, to speak on, then I wait till Saturday to even jot down, because I don't put, if you look in here, there are no notes in here. It's just scripture. That's all I do, it's just scripture. And so when I sit down, usually Saturday evening sometime, I pull the scriptures together, and, it just, and I, then I just put them out, and then usually I will put them together on my laptop at home, and then I come in here early, and then I print them out here. So that's what I did. So when I was printing these out, I had read through it, and, but for some reason, it, it, when I read it out here, other things come out. So anyway, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, he says here, the husbandman that labors must be first partaker of the fruits. In other words, the gardener, the one that's working the garden, should be first partaker. In other words, they are to be doing it before they tell everybody else to do it. Consider what I say, and the Lord will give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein, according to his gospel, I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. So what he's saying, because remember, here he's writing to Timothy, and he's telling him, listen, I'm, I'm considered an evildoer, even though I'm doing righteously. Well, when the world thinks you're doing evil, then you can pretty well be assured you're doing what's right. Because they think backwards, right? But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Now notice, when he talks about suffering, he's not talking about you suffering sickness or disease. He's talking about you suffering persecution. Because this, this is the context here, right? If we deny him, he also will deny us. And so you don't even hear that nowadays. Nowadays you got people, oh yeah, I'll deny Christ. If somebody puts a gun in my head, I'll deny Christ. And then later repent and turn around. Well, hopefully you live that long. Because just because you deny it doesn't mean they're not going to pull a trigger. So that's the wrong way to go out. But... Verse 13, if we believe not, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. In other words, listen, you may quit believing, but that doesn't change anything. God's going to be the same. Jesus is going to be the same. Doesn't matter what you believe. You understand what I mean? He's not going to change according to what you believe. You're going to have to change according to what he believes. Of these things, put them in remembrance. That's what I'm doing now. I'm putting you in remembrance. Charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Now understand what he's saying. I'm supposed to charge you that you don't get hung up on words and arguing back and forth that all it ends up doing is subverting your faith or causing you to have less faith. Now, my job is to cause you to have more faith in God and more faith means being able to stand when other people fold. So study, that means be diligent to show yourself approved unto God, a workman, oh, look at there, a workman. We are supposed to show ourselves workmen. Listen, if you don't work, you ain't a workman. You have to work to be a workman. Do you understand that? So if you're against works, you can't be this person. So 
a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane, now that usually means uh, something secular, okay? And vain babblings, well, that's a good word, vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as does a canker. In other words, you let that go on and it keeps eating away and eventually it will cause you to be weaker and eventually cause you to give up if you entertain that because you have to let it in. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, it just really didn't get much plainer than that, right? The Lord knows those who are his. And if you name the name of Christ, depart from iniquity, right? But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, set apart, and meet or useful for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. That's pretty simple. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Notice he didn't say do it with all men. Do it with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Jesus was a master at that. People would ask him questions, he wouldn't even respond. He acted like they didn't even say it, right? And he would just go right on it and say what he was going to say. <clears throat> That's a good way to learn. Because let me tell you, when you learn to live that way, guess what you become? You become buttonless. <laughs> a word I learned this morning. <laughs> Amen. How many of you want to be buttonless? Come on. Yes. Amen. That's right. Well, that's how you do it. All right? That way people can't push your buttons. Right? See? See, I was listening. I was listening. <laughs> so, all right. Now, it says, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strife. They cause problems. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. You hear that? You ever meet somebody that opposes themselves? Wow. <laughs> I've met some in ministry. Well, here, let me pray for you. Well, I got this sickness. I got this disease. I got this illness going on. Well, here, let me pray for you. Well, no, you don't understand. The Lord put this on me so that he can teach me. No, you're opposing yourself. Amen. See, I'm here to help you. Right. Let, me, let me read the rest of it. Let me show you what it says. He says that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now notice these, now the Bible says that the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That means he can't just devour everybody. But these are people that he has been able to devour at his will. Why? Because of what they're doing and how they're living, and they're, they haven't purged themselves, and they're not living a life worthy of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us to live a life worthy of Jesus Christ. That means we can live worthy. That means you can also live unworthy. Right. See, this is talking about the discipline of grace. People don't realize there is a discipline to the Christian life. Right? It's not just a get your card stamped and you know, wait for Jesus to take you out of here or die or whatever it is. That's not it. There is a life to be lived. So then he says in chapter 3, man put chapters there, God didn't. Because So the last word he says is and that in verse 26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. This know also. So in the, in the middle of all this, know this also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. How many think we might have some perilous times? Uh -huh. Right? Well, guess what? That wasn't a surprise to God. Shouldn't have been a surprise to us, really. <clears throat> like I said the other day, if God has been so adamant about getting this message, especially concerning the healing aspect of dominion, out to the church for the last 20 years, we should have kind of been ready for something to come along that we actually needed that information. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, 
covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, no self-control, no control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, despisers of those that are good. Think about that. See, remember that whenever the people call Christians haters, right? <clears throat> so, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Now, look at the, look at the remedy. From such turn away. It didn't say fellowship with them. It didn't say hang out with them. It said from such turn away. Now, for some of you to turn away, all you got to do is pick up that little remote and, <laughs> and that's you turning away from a lot of this stuff right there. Because do you realize how ridiculous it is that you will sit there and let people on the television talk to you, but you can't talk back? <laughs> now, you may talk back, but they don't hear you, right? Now, do you realize that? Now, why, why would you want to sit somewhere and listen to somebody talk to you that you cannot respond at some point? Amen? Especially if you disagree. I mean, I don't know how many times I have, especially in the past, I will tell you, I have not turned on the news in any form since November 3rd. Amen. Just telling you. Just haven't done it. Nothing. Right? And people say, well, you know, how do you live not knowing what's going on? I know what's going on. I know what's in my life. I know what's happening. There's just stuff I don't need to know. Right? Then all you do is get wrapped up and want to kill somebody. <laughs> That's all that happens. <laughs> not me. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Amen. But, you know, all you end up doing is just fighting side to side, and, and the whole point was to get you mad. Right? Because right? the, the people on each of those networks, they get together afterwards and go sit at the same restaurant and drink coffee together. And yet you got people sitting at home hating this one or hating that one, and yet they're all friends. Why? Because they're doing a job they get paid to do which is to get you riled up and do nothing. So anyway, let's keep on going. He says here, <clears throat> from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses by airwaves. I added that. Okay. And lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with various diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Yanes and Yambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. Now, you, now listen, if you can't be reprobate if you were never probate. Do you understand? <laughs> I know. I know. But do you understand what I'm saying? You can't be reprobate from something if you never had a part of that thing. So there is a departing that is able to take place. Right. See, listen, it's, it's like the worst thing you can do is be married to a person that doesn't want to be married to you. Isn't it right? They're always wanting a divorce. You don't. And so, and the thing is, that, that's, a, that's a horrible way to live, right? But now the, the situation, God ain't like that. You want out, he'll let you out. Now, he don't want you out, and he wants you, but he will not keep you against your will any more than he made you get saved against your will. And if he didn't make you get saved against your will, he won't keep you against your will. Just something to think about. All right, so <clears throat> before you get mad and say, I don't want nothing to do with God, better be careful. <laughs> he might go, same here, bye. <laughs> Who knows? Okay. So <laughs> he says, watch this, verse 9. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be, made, shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But you have fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my charity, my patience, my persecutions, my afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Notice, evil men, seducers, what are they trying to seduce? They're trying to seduce you out of the faith. And they will get worse and worse. But continue thou in the things which you have learned 
and have been assured of, knowing of whom you've learned them, and that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Notice how many times this talks about being workmen and good works. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, the living, and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. <clears throat> Sounds like he's catching a plane. <laughs> Doesn't it? Instead, he's just catching angels. Take him up. I have fought a good fight. What are we talking about? The discipline of grace. Right? I have fought a good, he didn't say, and it's all been fun and games and hey, it's been great here and man, hey, I've had such a good time, I hate to leave. No, he said over and over again, I'd rather be here than there or I'd rather be there than here, I should say it that way, right? Over and over again, he said, I'd rather be with Jesus but as long as I'm necessary here, here I am. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith and that word kept doesn't mean, well, I still believe what I used to. It literally has the idea of grabbing a hold of something, embracing it in, in such a way that it cannot be ripped out of your hands, right? It'd be like, in modern sport analogy, it'd be like the, uh, you know, the football player grabbing the ball and running and everybody trying to rip it out of him, you know, and strip it away from his hands, that he is fighting to keep it so that he can get across those goalposts. That's what Paul was saying. He said, I've got, I've kept the faith, I've still got the faith, and I will not let it be stripped away from me. He says, <clears throat> I have fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, because of all that, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Do your diligence to come shortly unto me. Now watch this next part, verse 10. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatian, Titus unto D Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with you, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Now he goes on, and watch this. He said, and go down to verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Now that doesn't sound like what you hear. Well, you know, just forgive him and it'll be okay. No, no, you have to understand, Paul was preaching the gospel and Alexander the coppersmith hindered the gospel by hindering Paul. And because of that, he said, the Lord reward him according to his works. He wasn't saying, repay him for what he did to me necessarily. He's saying, you have to understand what he has done, right, and why. But then he said, um, <clears throat> of whom be thou also aware, for he has greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. There you go. There's that Philippians 4, 13, strengthens me. That by me, the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Notice the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. How did the Lord deliver him? He was executed. Now see, that's not always the way people want to be delivered. But he was executed, so he didn't have to put up with any of this stuff anymore. Amen? And to him, it was a graduation. Finally, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, <clears throat> verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race all run? but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. 
And every man that strives for the mastery to win is temperate, self-controlled in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. I therefore so run not as uncertainly, disorderly, disorganized, so fight I, not as one that beats the air. In other words, I don't miss my punches. When I throw a punch, they land. He's saying, I'm not out here shadow boxing. I am hitting my opponent. And that's what he did every time he preached, every time he healed the sick, every time he witnessed to a person, he was hitting the devil in the face. He didn't throw out punches that didn't do any good. Amen? He says, but I keep, and the way the King James says, I keep under my body, the way we would say it is, I keep my body under. In other words, I keep my body under control and bring it, my body, into subjection. Now watch this. See, another part of the gospel nobody believes anymore. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Do you hear that? Paul, even the great apostle Paul recognized that after all his preaching, after all his suffering, after everything he's gone through, he still had to live the life. He still had to have discipline because he said, if I'm preaching this and I'm not living this, then I will be cast away. In other words, you get no points for what you have done. You get points for how you are living. Does that make sense? Now listen, this is the gospel. This is the Bible. This is scripture. This is not somebody trying to take away any responsibility so that they can have a bigger church. Because when you do that, you have a bigger church. Because people know there's no requirements. There's no responsibility. There's no discipline expected. Now, again, every example Paul used included either military, sports, or marriage. Now, in uh, Philippians chapter 3, we'll finish up here, I think. Yep. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Now, that's a strong word. Especially back then, people didn't, that would be almost like cussing from the pulpit, right? He said, that's, I, I consider this as worthless as all these things that I used to be mean nothing to me. And he said that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now watch this, verse 11. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He's talking as if that's not a done deal. That I might attain to this. Not as though I had already attained. Either we're already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. In other words, that I can actually get the thing that Jesus saved me for. <laughs> Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is another sports illustration here of what he's doing. He said, I press toward, I, I put forth effort to do this. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. In other words, if you, <laughs> it's amazing how Paul wrote this. In King James, it sounds really nice. But really, all he's saying is very simple to this. Listen, if you believe different than what I'm saying, God will show you the truth. What was he saying? I'm telling you the truth. And if you think different, you're wrong. And God will show you where you're wrong. Now, imagine if people did that today, if preachers did that. You'd say, well, who does he think he is? I mean, he thinks he's this or he thinks he's got that. No, but let me tell you, I know, I know that whenever I am speaking to you or speaking on behalf of God, 
I can tell you when it's my words and when it's him. I can tell you the difference. And my words are sometimes what he says that I'm trying to put into words that I use, and yet it's still his words. You understand? Yeah. But even in the middle of that, I have to recognize that I'm not here to have dominion over your faith and tell you, do this, don't do that. See, I, I, I don't do that. I share the truth with you, and I expect the Holy Spirit to work in you to show you what to do and what not to do. Yeah. And if that's not done, then at some point, yeah, we have to be specific and point things out. But the whole point of this is this, that you can, you yourself, as you, as you probably well know, you can tell that when you know that you're saying something that is absolutely no doubt about it, God speaking. And when that's the case, you tend to get pretty bold. You know, that's the thing. Most preachers, not most, but a lot of them, they're not sure. But the only reason they're not sure is because they listen to every commentary. They go to sermons.com or whatever it is to get their Sunday sermon. And they have no conviction behind what they're saying. But whenever you speak the truth, you know it's the truth, and you have a conviction because you're living the truth, everything changes and you have no problem saying it with the strength that not only comes from conviction, but brings conviction. So... He says, let us, well, let's go to verse 16. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers, to, followers together of me, and mark them which so walk as you have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. See, we have to realize there are people who are enemies of the cross. Everybody's not good. Everybody's not right. Does that make sense? <laughs> whose end is destruction. Whose God is their belly. In other words, they're just ministering for a paycheck. That's what he's saying. And whose glory is in their shame. Who mind earthly things. For our conversation, our citizenship, is the Greek word, is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things on earth. In other words, he can change your body because he can subdue it, right? But at this point, we have to keep our bodies under, amen? He can strengthen us to do it by grace so that we do not allow our bodies to cause us to let sin have dominion over us. Finally, this is chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Now listen, and everything I've been saying today, I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about the discipline of grace, that is a life that is lived in obedience due to gratitude. I, okay, I'll, I'll read these two sentences, and I'll stop here in just a minute, I promise. Okay. <laughs> Never forget where you came from. People who forget where they came from tend to not have any gratitude toward God for bringing them from there. The psalmist David talked about how he brought us out of the miry clay, right? And then we, of course, turned into a song. And how he put our feet on the rock. Amen? Amen. That was one of the things, well, the second thing here. If you can't remember where, where you were brought from and be thankfully obedient, you probably aren't saved. If you can't remember where you came from. Now, we should be looking where we're going. We should know who he has made us to be. We should be looking at that. But you never want to forget where you came from because that's your testimony. Not just, you know, I'm not talking about spending 45 minutes about how bad you were and then five minutes of, and then Jesus saved me, God bless you, and sit down. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you remembering and being thankful. Whether you're telling somebody else or you're just remembering, there are times when I'm driving and I'm just spending time with God and I, I remember where I was. And I remember 
where by all natural means where I should be. And honestly, like the rest of you, don't all sit there and look all holy. Amen. But like the rest of you, some of you should have been in the grave or in prison. But by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. But if you don't remember that, then you tend to get this entitlement thing where you think, well, I, I, I deserve to be blessed. No, Jesus deserves the blessing and you're in him and that's, that's why you get it because you're in him. Amen. Because even if you've done everything you're supposed to, the Bible says we're still unfaithful servants or unjust. I'm trying to remember the right words, right? But we are these, so even when we've done everything we've been told, we have still not become worthy to receive blessings. Amen? And the reason we do everything we're told is out of gratitude for what he brought us from, for how he changed us, changed our life, changed our minds, changed our bodies, whatever it is he's changed in our lives. But we have to remember where we came from. And as long as you're grateful and thankful, you will almost always walk in grace and not be like the dog returning to his vomit and going back and departing the faith. Amen? You can't be thankful for where you're from while you're still living in where you're from because you're not from there. Right. Amen? That's like people, a lot of people move here and go, well, I'm from this place, I'm from that place, and, and all they do is talk about where they're from. If it's so good, go back. <laughs> Adios, we'll let you leave. Amen? Does that make sense? Yeah. See, that's why, I, I, I'll be honest with you, when I, when I moved our family we were, my, my, my beginnings in Christ were just north of here in the next county up, Grayson County. That was where I really started following God. But before that, that's where I was crazy. That's where I was of the devil. I mean, that's, that was the horrible place. That was bad, right? And it's funny because whenever I got a hold of God or he got a hold of me, we moved from there. And I remember when we moved out of Grayson County, and I said, I will never live in Grayson County again. Why? Because there's too much bad. And so we moved, and we'd never moved back there. We had the opportunity several times. Yeah, that'd be good. Nope, not going to happen. Why? Because I'm from there, and I'm from all that that represents in my mind, and I will never move back there. Amen? Because I don't believe in going backwards. We move forward. Now, I know it's more than just a place, but you have to understand you can make that break. Abraham, Abram had to leave and go somewhere else to get to his promised land. Amen. Amen? Because too many, a lot of times too many people remember you and they'll keep treating you like you were. And if you keep talking about it all the time, see people, people that their entire life is hung up in giving their testimony usually end up going back into it. If all you ever do is talk about how God got you out of drugs, a lot of times you go right back into drugs because all you're talking about is drugs. Especially if you're doing 45 minutes of talking about drugs and then five minutes of Jesus saved you. Now, you're not called to preach that. You're called to preach who you are now, what Christ has done in you. You can look back and go, thank God I'm not that. But I am this. And what I am, he made me. And that's your testimony. Amen? Does that, does that make sense? So there is a discipline in grace. There is an ability. There is a strengthening. The, the people that preach the, the hyper grace idea that sin doesn't matter anymore, they have actually caused grace to be diminished and to have no power in their life. And the sad part about that is once you do that, you have no hope because there's nothing. You have tread underfoot the blood of Christ. You have nothing to go back to because that is your salvation. The grace of God was your salvation. And when that has no power... You're hopeless. So understand, the grace of God has a discipline. There is a lifestyle of gratitude. There is a discipline to it. And whenever you realize that and you decide to be disciplined, God empowers you with grace to overcome and not to succumb to temptation. Amen? Did you get anything out of this today? All right, well, we're going to stop here.